The Yabalapichi live in central Brazil, south of the Amazon rainforest. Today, they're celebrating the beginning of the Pequi festival, which honors their fruit trees and hummingbird spirits. It's also the last event in their seasonal calendar of rituals. Colorful dances and games bring cheer to the hardest time of the year. For tribes of the Amazon basin, the rainy season is a continuous one, lasting for half the year. But on this occasion, the Pequi festival threatens to be very different. Unknown to the villagers, the village shaman has predicted a lunar eclipse. For a deeply superstitious community who fear the forces of the supernatural, an eclipse would bring powerful, possibly malicious spirits into their village. For the moment, the chief, his leaders, and the community are unaware of events about to unfold. Xingu National Park lies in the heart of Brazil and south of the Amazon rainforest. In 1961, it became South America's first indigenous park and an ecological haven belonging to the tribes of the Xingu region. The park is a realm of rivers and headwaters which flow into the River Xingu. The River Xingu itself joins the mighty Amazon 1,000 miles to the north. For the communities of Xingu, the rivers and lagoons are the lifeblood of their culture. One of these Xingu peoples is the Yawala Pichi. Today, the villagers of Yawala Pichi are celebrating the Paki festival, unaware of any problems that may lie ahead. The festive games are called Alu Kaka, which will test the men's prowess and strength. Before the women and children join in the game, the men follow a ceremonial approach to the courtyard in front of the men's hut. This is the most important space in the village because it's the place where their ancestors are buried. The men have oiled up their bodies in preparation for an assault by the women, and it's Chief Aritana who calls the women to the men's hut. The men can only silently await the frenzy. Women love the Alukaka games. It's one of the few times of year when control swings noticeably in their favor. At the front is Chumin, the wrestling champion, and the line stretches back to the youngest and weakest. The rules of the game are straightforward. The women must break the line and tear the young warriors off, one man at a time. Eventually, the only man left is the wrestling champion. The game ends when the women tear him away from the pole. The games continue throughout the day, bringing a festive atmosphere to the normally hard-working community. Around 200 people live in the village at any one time. Cultural events, such as the Pequi Festival, bring the community together. Everyone takes great pride to wear their traditional clothes and adornments. As the day progresses, the games become increasingly boisterous. The next game to be played is unashamedly sexual and great fun. It's a game where genders are reversed. The women pretend to be men, who gang together to answer the taunts of their opposites. Pretending to be women, the men are pounced on by the other sex.
After the day's revelry, the village women go off to the river to bathe. Women bathe separately to the men, except when with their husbands or close family. Now that the games are over, the village has quietened down. But an unexpected event has brought the Yawalapichi leaders to the men's hut. Chief Aritana has been informed by the shaman that tonight there'll be a lunar eclipse. For Shingu peoples, an eclipse is a sacred event. If it does indeed take place, this will mean postponing the Peki festival. The news will dramatically transform events in the village. One of the first rituals performed during a lunar eclipse involves the young men. They will be whipped as the earth's shadow passes over the moon. After the meeting, the men head for a small river on the other side of the village to bathe. Before the leaders inform the young men that they will later be whipped, they must be sure that the eclipse really will take place. Traditionally, it's the shaman who predicts an eclipse, and the shaman has more than one way of knowing. There is another way that a shaman knows of a forthcoming eclipse. Animal behavior is affected by the moon. Though an untrained ear might not notice these subtleties, it's the skill of a medicine man to be aware of these natural signs. The name of the village shaman who predicted the eclipse is Aira. He fears the eclipse. The moon is a powerful creation spirit that will menstruate and even drip blood on the earth. If an eclipse does indeed take place tonight, the Yawalapichi believe that supernatural spirits will descend on their village. The spirits might bring illness, even death. Shortly before midnight, the eclipse begins. Chief Aritana has already called the young men to the men's hut for the rituals to begin. It's important that the tribesmen remain festive and good-natured. If they don't, then the spirits might punish them. An eclipse is seen as a time of renewal and an awakening. As part of this awakening, they begin beating young men in front of the invisible spirits. The spirits are not offended by laughter or jokes, only if they're forgotten or ignored. The whipping is considered to make the young warriors more courageous. They rid themselves of old fears by running off into the dark. <laughs> the eclipse has brought supernatural spirits into the village. The Yawalapichi respond by playing their most sacred instrument, the Jakui pipes. It's taboo for women to look at these flutes or even for them to be filmed. 
Throughout the night, their haunting sounds echo across the village from the men's hut. It's the first morning after the eclipse, and the cycle of ceremonies continues. A group of musicians awaken the village with their flutes. This is called the Takwara ceremony, where the flutes must pass from house to house throughout the whole morning. Inside the long houses, young women are being painted up to join the procession. Both mother and daughter want to please the spirits of the eclipse and show them the effort they've made to enchant them. The flute procession continues along the ring of houses, heralding the day of the dances ahead. Grass fibers are tied in a girdle around the girl's waist. A short reed provides the final detail. It's alluring and it shows off her feminine beauty. As the flute procession grows, the musicians pick up the adorned women as they move from one house to the next. The women of the taquara stand with their backs to the flutes. They're not supposed to look at the musicians till they join them. The next dance in the cycle of ceremonies is the Tapanawarana. As with all the dances, it's being held to demonstrate to the eclipse spirits that they've not been forgotten. This is, in fact, a rehearsal, since the Yabalapichi practice all their dances, often for many days at a time. By late afternoon, it's in full swing. The drummer and singer keep time which the dancers follow with their steps. If the rhythm speeds up, the dancers respond by speeding up as well. The women hold on to the men to keep time. So long as they know the moves of the dances, any woman can dance with any man. The whole dance tells a mythical story about spirits of the water world. The movements of the dance, especially the swing of arms, symbolize fish swimming in water. As the dance continues in the center of the village, Chief Aritana watches eagerly. Close by is the shaman Ayura, ever watchful. Aritana is pleased that the day's dances have gone well. By honoring the traditions, it means that the supernatural spirits will protect his people. <laughs> on the second day after the eclipse. Two elders, Hinako and Uelupe, have gone spearfishing. The older men of the tribe still practice this traditional method of fishing, though nets and fishing lines are now common in the Shingu. But spearfishing is highly valued and highly effective. The arrows used for spearfishing have two prongs giving a fisherman a better chance of hitting the slippery fish than a single point. The hunter must not only be able to spot the fish through the water's glare, but aim through the surface which distorts the true position of the fish. Inako makes a strike. The arrow stays in the fish, allowing him to retrieve it. It's a perfect shot, but if he doesn't make sure the fish is dead, it might wriggle out of the canoe. The elders continue stalking the fish throughout the morning. Yabalapichi fishermen know their environment intimately, especially where the fish hide at different times of day and in different seasons.
With their catch of the morning, the fishermen can return to the village, knowing that there's food in the men's hut for the rest of today's ceremonies. In the center of the village, Chumin, the champion wrestler, waits by the men's hut for the other young men to join him. They've arranged to practice hookah hookah wrestling in preparation for a contest that will take place during the next eclipse ceremony. The young men are nervous. Wrestling matches are lively events where their skills will be on show for everyone to see. Training takes place on the sacred ground in front of the men's hut. Wrestling in the Shingu is known as hookah hookah after the taunting sounds the opponents make. These mimic the roar of a jaguar and are intended to frighten and intimidate. <laughs> Winning is straightforward. Either grab both your opponent's legs or throw him on his back. Each match usually has two or three runs and lasts from a few seconds to a quarter of an hour. The length depends on what happens between the players, and every game is different. Every tribe wants a champion. Famous wrestlers are talked about for many years after their death. Although hookah hookah wrestling is still popular with the Shingu tribes, the young men have discovered new sports such as football. Breaking away from tradition, women have also begun to wrestle, often to the amusement of the men. Today, there's even talk that the women might hold their own contest for the next eclipse ceremony. The villagers are also preparing for the next eclipse ritual and exchange ceremony. In the heat of the day, the long houses are the coolest place to be. They're made from wood and grass thatch and are larger than a passenger jet. Up to 40 people live in each one of these huts. Entire families of several generations all share the same space. The exchange ceremony and the wrestling match, however, now look increasingly unlikely to take place today. A storm is heading directly for the village. The village leaders try to drive away the thunderclouds with a spell. Aritana can only watch in vain as the day's activities are forced to a sudden standstill. Far in the distance, the champion wrestler Chumin tries to brave the oncoming storm. Two days have now passed since the Peki festival was first announced. The once festive mood in the village has noticeably changed. No one in the community can recall when a lunar eclipse coincided with a Peki festival. And now their best efforts to complete the cycle of ceremonies have come to a damp end. The next morning brings with it the first signs of discontent. Some villagers are complaining about headaches. Worse still, old rumors of sorcery have resurfaced. Chief Aritana is aware that problems are mounting, and it's his job to retain harmony in the village. Among Shingu Indians, even powerful chiefs have to respect the opinions of the village leaders and the community at large. Aritana has acquired a great reputation for his qualities as a leader. <laughs> Yeri patsukari au manapa laukulanya 
Jadi kamu lawak video di sana Berhak jadi ke Akan diri Jajah katua lagi Jadi awak diri kan diri um, Jadi Aca ama maka pak wano Kekat Itap Puh cari Kan diri Aku kini muti atas Azo Ikunu Taz Azo Daily life for the Shingu peoples includes the presence of ancestral spirits and supernatural forces. But the added presence of gossip and rumor make it no easy task being chief. In times of trouble, Aritana looks to his own guiding spirits. Yatama punya muka, pakai ke bunga putar cia pun yatama, yatama ke. Ye, iruka yatama, kapukah kapal putar la buka ira yatama, ili buka nata apa apa, tala apa apa luta buka, ili buka. One of the young men in the village has suffered a resurgence of nightmares and is blaming the presence of a bad spirit. Tatao is the chief's nephew and he's decided to perform a painful bloodletting ceremony. The scratching implement is made from sharp fish teeth. The teeth score the skin rather than cutting it, though blood is still drawn. Scratching is a healing ritual and is often only applied to their arms and feet. Today, Tatao has chosen to have his entire body scratched. Tatao's wife, Irika, has also chosen to perform the healing rite. It's exactly the same for women. They also endure the scratching with no show of pain or suffering. The chief has made his announcement. The exchange ceremony and the wrestling contest will now go ahead. Some Shingu communities call the exchange ceremony Moitara, but in Yabalapichi, the exchange ceremony is known as Utluxi. Because it's only a demonstration ritual to please the eclipse spirits, one half of the village is pretending to be a neighboring tribe who have come to trade. Traditionally, exchange ceremonies are a chance for neighboring communities to formally meet, gather news, and resolve any unsettled disputes. When Shingu tribes meet to exchange and barter their crafts, the event is followed by a wrestling contest. The young men get a rare opportunity to demonstrate their wrestling skills. <laughs> The biggest hookah hookah contests are in fact held during a funeral ritual called a kuarup. But today, the eclipse ceremonies provide an unexpected chance to practice their tribal sport. As the wrestling contest develops, the atmosphere among the young men becomes infectious until the more formal duels erupt into a boisterous frenzy. The excitement is not yet over. Before the day is done, the women will also hold their own wrestling contest. Takan, the organizer of the women's wrestling, is first into the ring. 
The women use the same moves and the same skills as the male wrestlers. There are no special rules just because they're women. Irika, from the same household as Takan and Anna, now enters. Although shy, she's got a reputation for being a formidable wrestler. The next morning, life returns to its normal pace. But there's still an atmosphere of excitement in the air, since the women are again planning a special ceremony. This time, they'll perform a Yamari Kuma. It will be the last eclipse ceremony. First, manioc needs to be harvested. This important vegetable is central to the survival of the community. The manioc grows in large plantations on the outskirts of the village. The plants quickly grow into tall bushes but it's the roots they're after. Among Shingu Indians, producing manioc bread is strictly a woman's role. Because of their skills in transforming vegetables into bread, women are at the heart of the community's daily survival. If no one brings fish back from the river, at least there'll be bread on the plate. Making that bread is a skillful task. The women make it look easy, but it's only because they've been doing it since childhood. The first stage of bread making is to scrape the tough outer skin of the manioc then the vegetable has to be squashed to a pulp and soaked. The vegetable pulp is then washed to drain the natural toxins that would otherwise make a person ill. This in turn is squeezed several times till it's purified. The sticky dough is then left in the sun to dry. Dried manioc flour is called beju, which is cooked on a wide clay plate over the fire. The gluten in the beju is sticky enough to hold the bread in one piece. Later in the day, the women prepare for the yamari kuma. The yamari kuma is a special ceremony performed by women in all the Shingu communities. During the dance, they look their most beautiful, and it will take many hours for the women to prepare the adornments. The patterns have no specific meaning, except that they follow geometric designs traditional to the Shingu region. Each woman is painted according to the expression of the painter, which will always be another woman. Solidarity is strong between the women, united by one overriding fact of life, hard work. The women usually marry around the age of 16, traditionally to a man chosen by their family. But times are changing. Takan divorced her chosen husband against her parents' wishes and later remarried. I said to her, huh? Papa not to cow. Niat, niat, they be a new pay. I said to her, no, no. Not to lie, I'm not to appear in the eyes of no, no, no more. 
At the end of the afternoon, the Yamari Kuma begins. It's a ceremony usually reserved for welcoming only the most important visitors. But today, they're dancing for the eclipse spirits. During Yamari Kumas, women are allowed to don the headdresses usually worn by men. The dazzling colors of the headdresses come from birds such as Tukan, from which the name of the whole tribe Yamalapichi derives. The Yamari Kuma continues for many hours and eventually comes to an end at dusk. The eclipse ceremonies are over. That night, something unexpected unfolds in the village. Just when they thought their problems were over, there is talk of sorcery. Shortly before nightfall, an incident took place. A woman called Kerry fell into a delirious trance and ran over to the shaman's house, accusing him of witchcraft. Four days earlier, the shaman predicted that something bad would happen. But not even Ayura could have guessed that it would happen to him. Since nightfall, the shaman's house has stood empty. He's fled Yawalapichi in fear of his life. Though it's only an accusation, Shingu Indians in the past have been known to kill sorcerers, and his family persuaded him to leave for his own safety. Meanwhile, Kere's family have sent a canoe upriver to fetch a famous shaman who they believe can break the spell. Inside the longhouses, the villagers are divided on whether Aira is indeed to blame. Either way, Shingu Indians fear supernatural spirits, but even more, they fear sorcerers. Before dawn, the renowned shaman has already arrived and begun the healing ceremony. First, he inhales smoke, which is considered sacred. There's no narcotic in the cigar, and the trance is self-induced. Nevertheless, it's the gift of a healer to be able to quickly slip into another state of consciousness. The healing ritual is by nature intense. The medicine man is fighting black magic. The shaman has now entered a world that only a medicine man sees and understands. He'll see shapes and objects that tell him what's causing his daughter's illness. A piece of string that he's found nearby suddenly becomes a physical representation of the spell that's strangling Kerry's soul. He cuts through the string, symbolically releasing the spell. Smoke is associated with the spirit world and a constant part of the healing ritual. Kerry now relies on her father to remove the power of the sickness through hands-on contact. For the rest of the day, the village waits while Kerry recovers. Although the eclipse ceremonies are now over, they won't begin the happy Pecky Festival if anyone is unwell in the village. Meanwhile, three elders have been sent out of the village to talk to the spirits of the Pecky trees. 
Before any festival can continue, the men must perform this traditional rite. They will ask the spirits that protect their peggy trees for more fruit in the year to come. The next morning, with the festival back on the agenda, some of the Yabalapichi men have gone to the swamp. They're cutting wood to make carvings of hummingbirds used in the climax of the Peggy festival. Shingu Indians believe the tree to be guarded by spirits that take the form of hummingbirds. The fruit of the Peggy tree provides them with oil and is also cooked and eaten or made into a drink called Mingao. As soon as they brought the wood back to the men's hut, the birds begin to take shape. Bird carving is a man's job, and each one of them takes great pride in his handiwork. Once the carvings are ready, it's time to bring the hummingbirds to life with decoration. The Yabalapichi use the juice of a wild fruit called urukum to get the red color. The hummingbirds are ready. They're left in the most sacred space of the village, in front of the men's hut, where the ancestors are buried. There they will stand until it's time for the bird ceremony to begin. Finally, the villagers return to the celebrations of the Peki festival. Even Aritana is pleased. They've decided to continue with the Alukaka games interrupted five days ago by the eclipse. Starting at the far end of the line, the women try to break off one man at a time. They're allowed to pull, grapple, tickle, thump, pry and squeeze. This of course can be painful for the men. And for those watching, highly amusing. Soon, the line will be down to one man, Chuman, the champion wrestler. He must resist all the women together. The Alukaka games are now over. They began five days ago before the eclipse interrupted the festive occasion and brought great change to the village. Tomorrow, life in the village will return to normal and they'll remove the elaborate decorations worn at the ceremonies. But there is one final dance to be performed and for this, the men go to special effort to paint their bodies. The decorations range from butterflies to imaginary beings. <laughs> The dance of the pecky birds is the grand finale of the festival. Inside the long houses, the women wait to join the procession. Each long house receives a procession which moves from house to house throughout the afternoon. Eh, semua lagi mana tak kawan punya cekinat, 
Kayo no ba ikata ka nire? Ire ayo mahu ti jo ti kuta kina kata yatama yatama ka. Ita ba kata asut? Ire ko ka nire he yatama uka yuno ba kata yatama no mace ti sanuka yatama yatama utawa kata ka yuno pi. Malu apa maga uka? Semua aji wakar apa maga uka? Semua aji wakar pukar he nyirukar yuno papa. Tapu pukar aso ihe petua pukar he ka itse pukar ida. Visible to all on the tall poles are the sacred hummingbirds. The Yawalapichi believe that they are carrying the hummingbird spirits around the village. The ceremony comes to an end where it began, next to the men's hut, the most sacred place for the Yawalapichi. <laughs> Jadi tiap puluh kali azu pun, jadi kali itu kawan rata puluh kali azu mua, azu mua. Atau waktu kita awal waktu pun cepat azu mua, aji dia, maka tuan dia akan diri. Jadi aja nyawa senyawa, uta ini pak video tisana. Apa yang kenal, maka tuan dia atas itu pak video tisana. Berapa tuan dia pak pak waktu kaya tuan pak dia azu mua. The elders take the hummingbird carvings, which they believe still contain the living spirits away from the village. Once they reach the pecky tree groves, they will rest them against the trees and return home. Hopefully, the spirits will be satisfied by their ceremonies and rituals, and will bring them a bountiful harvest in the year to come.